So let's start. Hello everyone, welcome back. So in the last session, we have learned about group of potassium disorders which is hypokalemia. In today's session, we will be learning about hyperkalemia. Okay. So we know that the normal potassium is between 4.5 to 5.5. So, whenever the potassium levels are more than 5.5 millimoles per liter, we call it hyperkalemia. So, always rule out pseudo hyperkalemia. Pseudo hyperkalemia can be because of what? So, we know that the potassium is predominantly an intracellular ion. So, whenever the potassium moves out, it can result in pseudo hyperkalemia, right? So, whenever there is hemolysis, right? You have taken the sample and left it. Then what happens? The cells begin to break after some time and it causes pseudo hyperkalemia. In erythrocytosis or mucocytosis also, you can have pseudo hyperkalemia. Alright, now let us understand the etiology of hyperkalemia. So, again the etiology of hyperkalemia can be because of external excessive amount of potassium which is very very rare because the potassium gets excreted out. Right? So, what you have to remember is transcellular shift, hypoaldosteronism. If you go back and understand hypokalemia properly, you will understand that hypoaldosteronism is associated with hyperkalemia. Then presence of renal disease or adrenal insufficiency. Okay. So, what kind of transcellular shifts? So, whenever, whenever the sodium potassium ATP is pumping outwards, that means that the main aim of the sodium potassium ATP is, is that it pumps potassium inside for sodium outside, right? So, there are certain conditions in which there is activation of the sodium potassium pump and more potassium is pumped inside that we have seen in the chapter of hypokalemia. Here, there can be some ions which basically cause more outward movement of potassium. So, one is acidosis, second is beta blockers. So, if you remember the causes of hypokalemia, under transcellular shift we have learnt alkalosis and we have learnt beta agonist. So, the exact opposite of that which is your acidosis and beta blockers, then drugs such as digoxin, then tumor lysis syndrome and rhabdomyolysis. So, what is this tumor lysis syndrome? In this tumor lysis as the name suggests, there is a big burden of a tumor or in a cancer. More commonly, it is associated with hematological malignancies, but it can also be seen with solid organ malignancies. So, whenever the tumor burden is very high and they begin to lyse, so when they begin to lyse, the intracellular potassium starts moving outside and it can result in hyperkalemia. Okay, rhabdomyolysis we have already seen in the hypokalemia chapter as well. Rhabdomyolysis as the name suggests means myolysis. So, the muscle breakdown is happening, right? So, the muscle breakdown is happening and this results in the secretion of potassium outside. Now, hypoaldosteronism. So, aldosterone is responsible for reabsorption of sodium in water and excretion of potassium. So, the situations where there is decreased aldosterone, there is decreased excretion of potassium. So, this is seen in certain genetic conditions. It can be seen in conditions where there is a resistance to mineral corticoid action. Aldosterone has to go and act on the aldosterone receptors, but the receptors are resistant to its action. Then in certain tubular interstitial diseases. Renal cause is the most common cause, right? In AKI, in acute kidney injury where there is requirement of renal replacement therapy, right? So, if there is persistent hyperkalemia in acute kidney injury due to multiple causes, it can be maybe because of sepsis, it can be because of an obstruction, which can be because of a tumor or a stone or it can happen even due to insults such as snake toxin or any other toxin, there can be blatant hyperkalemia. So, if there is persistent hyperkalemia in AKI, it becomes indication for dialysis, indication for renal replacement therapy. A hallmark feature of CKD, a hallmark electrolyte imbalance associated with CKD is your hyperkalemia. Then adrenal insufficiency, similar to hypoaldosteronism, adrenal insufficiency is also associated with hyperkalemia. So, this is about in broad about the various etiologies of hyperkalemia. Now, never forget to ask a thorough drug history whenever you encounter a patient with hyperkalemia. Right? So, what are the drugs? You have to remember in hypertensive individuals always understand that the presence of ACE inhibitors and ARBs. Why? Because these ACE inhibitors and ARBs basically decrease the solute load. 
they decrease the solute load right and they are inhibitors of what they are inhibitors of angiotensin converting enzyme that means that the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is inhibited so in effect they cause hypoaldosteronism only right so in effect they cause hypoaldosteronism only so that is how they cause hyperkalemia then nsaids heparin beta blockers certain immunomodulatory drugs like cyclosporin tacrolimus mineralocorticoid receptor antagonist the aldosterone is not able to act so this inhibitor is your spironolactone then enac inhibitor amyloride where did we see this enac channel in our understanding of hypokalemia under little syndrome we have we have read that little syndrome occurs due to mutation of the enac channel so any drug which is used in its treatment such as amyloride which is an enac inhibitor can result in hyperkalemia okay so always take a thorough drug history in when you are trying to understand why exactly a patient is having hyperkalemia first rule out pseudo hyperkalemia and then look at the drugs all right now let us go to the clinical features of hyperkalemia so most importantly very very important we have to understand that potassium especially hyperkalemia predisposes to cardiac arrhythmias you can have a vtvf you can also have a cardiac arrest you can also have a cardiac arrest that is the reason why refractory hyperkalemia is an indication for dialysis because if it is not at all responding there is a high risk of cardiac arrest and hence you have to dialyze the patient what are the ecg changes you find these kind of tall t waves tall tented t waves this is your first ecg sign of hyperkalemia then you can have st segment elevation you can have st segment elevation then you can have pr segment prolongation the pr segment becomes prolonged finally you can have loss of p waves the p waves are not there and lastly you can have this sine wave pattern when the potassium is especially going up beyond 8 you can have this sine wave pattern so this is about your ecg changes of hyperkalemia now let us go to the approach of hyperkalemia now you have seen that there is hyperkalemia the potassium is more than 5.5 the potassium is more than 5.5 rule out pseudo hyperkalemia rule out pseudo hyperkalemia make sure that your sample was taken properly many a times what happens is that a practical point that you have to remember is whenever you take the sample the sister what does she do she applies a tourniquet she applies a tourniquet and then takes a sample for the potassium so many a times that itself can cause lysis when by the time you send it to the lab so you try and get a non tourniquet sample you get a non tourniquet sample rule out the other causes of pseudo hyperkalemia as well apart from that if the potassium is more than 6 ecg changes are there directly go and treat the patient do not wait for any investigation okay fine you do a history and physical rule out your transcellular shift right we have already learned is it because of drugs like digoxin beta blocker metabolic acidosis or is it because of hyperkalemic periodic paralysis we have learned hypokalemic similarly there is a hyperkalemic periodic paralysis as well is it insulin exercise so on and so forth after that you see the urinary potassium you see the urinary potassium and you see whether this is a renal loss so you see the urinary potassium and you see whether this is a renal loss apart from that you see your urine sodium if there is a decreased sodium delivery then we go along that course which is nothing but your hypoaldosteronism and so on if there is not you look at the ttkg ttkg we have already learnt in your hypokalemia chapter as well this refers to your transtubular potassium gradient this refers to your transtubular potassium gradient so this is given by urinary potassium into serum osmolality by urinary osmolality into serum potassium so ttkg becomes more so important in hyperkalemia than in hypokalemia because it is used to find out if it is because of a reduced tubular flow or is it because of a secretory defect the ttkg is more than 8 it is because of a reduced tubular flow in advanced kidney disease in advanced kidney disease 
if ttkg is less than 5 that means that there is a secretory problem that means that there is a secretory problem right so in this you have to do what we call as a 9 alpha fludrocortisone challenge test you do a fludrocortisone challenge test after the fludrocortisone challenge test if the ttkg increases to 8 then it is because of hypoaldosteronism Otherwise, it is because of tubular resistance where it can be because of drugs or tubular interstitial disease or it can be because of urinary tract obstruction, sickle cell anemia and PHA basically stands for pseudo-hypoaldosteronism. Pseudo-hypoaldosteronism is a condition where you have resistance to the action of aldosterone. So, it results in a pseudo-hypoaldosteronism. Right? So, the aldosterone levels will be elevated in these conditions. Okay? Fine. Before we go on further, let us just put things back into perspective. You have found out there is hyperkalemia, right? You rule out pseudo hyperkalemia. Once you rule out pseudo hyperkalemia, you take a non tunique sample and then you see if there is evidence of transcellular shift. You also go through all the drugs. After that, you will look for your urine electrolytes. You look for your urine potassium, urine sodium to see if this is the renal cause. Then you calculate the TTKG. If the TTKG is high, then it is because of a decreased renal flow or due to chronic kidney disease. If the TTKG is low, you see is this because of a resistance at the level of the collecting duct or is it because of a actual hypoaldosteronism, right? So if the TTKG response is not there to fludrocortisone challenge test, when you give fludrocortisone, then the TTKG has to increase beyond 8. If it increases beyond 8, that means it is your actually your aldosterone is low. Otherwise, it means that there is a resistance. Otherwise, this means that there is a resistance to the action of aldosteronism because of tubular interstitial disease, sickle cell anemia, various drugs or pseudo-hypoaldosteronism which is a genetic condition. Now, in actual hypoaldosteronism, you see with that is a, so you see the renin levels. If the renin is high and the aldo is low, then you are looking at primary adrenal insufficiency, ketoconazole or aldosterone deficiency. If the renin is also low, then it can be seen in certain conditions like diabetes or tubular interstitial diseases. Alright, so this portion maybe you can omit, you don't have to know it that much in detail. But just remember that the fludrocortisone test is used to identify actual hypoaldosteronism versus pseudo-hypoaldosteronism. Okay, so in pseudo hypoaldosteronism, there will be no resistance, resistance, sorry, there will be no response to fludrocortisone, but in actual hypoaldosteronism, there will be a response in the TTKG to fludrocortisone challenge test. Alright, so this is about your approach to hyperkalemia. Fine, fine till here. Now, let us understand the treatment of hyperkalemia. So, the first drug which has to be used in the management of hyperkalemia is your calcium gluconate. So, what is the use or what is the function of this calcium gluconate? This is a cardiac membrane stabilizer. This is a cardiac membrane stabilizer. This is a cardiac membrane stabilizer. So, what it does is it does not affect the potassium, rather, it makes the cardiac membrane stable enough for so that you do not have any arrhythmias. So, it makes the cardiac membrane stable enough so that it prevents arrhythmias. How is this calcium gluconate given? It is given as 10 ml calcium gluconate, 10% IV over 10 minutes, right? So, 10 to 15 minutes, you give it as a slow IV infusion, okay? Then you see your transcellular shift. So, many a times you give drugs which again antagonize the transcellular shift. So, you give insulin in dextrose. We know that insulin causes hypokalemia. We have learnt it in the hyperkalemia chapter. So, don't you feel that insulin can be used in the treatment of hyperkalemia? That's exactly what we do. So, we give 10 units of insulin in 50 ml of 50% dextrose. Why? Because if you give direct insulin, there are chances of hypoglycemia. That is the reason why we give insulin in dextrose. So, 10 units of insulin in 50 ml of 50% dextrose. Right? So, this will go and antagonize or it antagonizes the or it helps in the transcellular shift. It pushes the potassium intracellularly. Then you can give inhaled beta agonist. So, what we do in the ward is we give three rounds of acetylene. You give one round of acetylene for 20 minutes, then another round, then another round. So, this will push the potassium inside. 
right then removal of potassium through the git removal of potassium can happen even through the git in milder forms of hyperkalemia you give them what is called as the k bind we call it by the name k bind so what is it binding to what is it this is your sodium polystyrene sulfate sodium polystyrene sulfate which is a potassium binder it goes to the git they are available as granules so you swallow it it goes to the git and it binds the potassium novel binders include pateromer which is a potassium calcium exchanger okay and the most effective the most effective drug which has been there till now is that if the potassium is not responding to any of this then you go ahead and do a hemodialysis you do a hemodialysis so hd is the final treatment right so in refractory hyperkalemia you have found out the cause ruled out drugs you have done everything you have given calcium gluconate prevented the transfellowship you have also used gi methods then you will have to do a hemodialysis okay so this brings us to the end of our discussion on potassium disorders and hyperkalemia